Today, we're going to be talking about laughter. We're going to review why we laugh. We're going to discuss some of our cortical mapping and epilepsy cases where laughter was elicited. Uh, and we're going to review some cases where laughter can be viewed as a uh, trig or a calling card for pathologic states. So it, there's a great paper by Provine et al. that uh, summarizes a lot of the background on laughter, but laughter is remarkably stereotyped in humans. We have about five cycles of laughing per breath, and if you look at human cycles of what they do per breath, there's a limited number of strides per breath, a limited number of words per breath. It tends to be in fixed ratio, so we have these relationships to a vocalization or sound with our breathing. Chimps, on the other hand, have one breath per laugh, and their laughter sounds creepy. It's sort of like this. <laughs> anyway, um, the stimulus for laughter is involuntary, and uh, we'll get into that more later as we get more sophisticated, as we myelinate more anteriorly into associative cortexes, some of that involuntary laughter could be uh, seen as pseudo laughter if uh, you think of it. So according to Dr. Sotero, our pediatric neurology director, the smile in an infant begins at two months as a fart smile. <laughs> It's just, <laughs> uh, no, not, not today. Uh, children will track at two months. They'll cry in response to boredom at two months. They'll start eating soft foods at three months and begin sleeping through the night around three months. And they'll laugh at four months. And this is well prior to babbling, well prior to stranger anxiety. And it's well prior to language. And, um, if you think about it, what's myelinated at four months, laughter mechanisms must involve paths that are myelinated early, particularly ones that coordinate breathing with focalization. The um, other things that happen around four months, this is a background uh, posterior dominant rhythm chart of EEG. This may appear on things like neurosurgical boards. It basically shows that background rhythms increase as we age, and at four months, they start becoming synchronous. So a pediatric, a, a neonatal to an infantile EEG, neonatal EEGs are not continuous necessarily, and they're poorly synchronized. By four months, they become synchronous, and they've started to cycle through stages of wake and sleep. And that synchronicity implies that the myelination patterns have hooked into regulators of timing like the thalamus and um, are communicating back and forth from structures like the thalamus to the hippocampus where we're starting to code and make memory. What else happens? The myelination patterns tend to be more midline and posterior first. So the splenium myelinates first, followed by the genu. The EEG amplitudes, the height of the waves, increase with age. And then by four to six months, non-REM sleep states begin developing. And that's when we code our memory, typically. The P1 occipital latency, that's a visual-based stimulus that we see in the occipital recordings, uh, starts showing adult durations between stimulus and presence in the occiput, which implies that the optic pathways to the occipital cortex are also beginning to work appropriately. So now you've got pathways that connect vision to memory to breathing. And this is also correspondingly the time when we start seeing infantile spasms where increases in epileptic tone begin, and sometimes those are associated with laughter. So why do we laugh at such a young age? Uh, obviously, presumably for bonding, I mean, if a child is uh, needing as much help as they do, they're cute, they laugh, you want to give them attention, uh, it engages parents and others, and it also helps pattern their breathing for later expression of language. You could argue, though, that um, for kids, the laughter becomes a very important structure in language of grammar, specifically. So when you think about grammar, presumably you're thinking punctuation and commas and semicolons and so forth. It turns out that laughter punctuates ideas. So uh, imagine a jack in a box. You're 
turning the handle and it surprises the child, the child reacts and then realizes that stimulus is not threatening despite it appearing so, and then the child laughs. The, the laughter encapsulates that whole experience. And similarly, the parent expressing a, um, you know, a smile or a babble or a coo, um, the laughter encapsulates the idea that's given to the child and helps deliver a packet of information What about as we age? As we age, myelination past link temporal to association frontal pathways. Um, the nature of what triggers laughter begins to change from a very primitive uh, visual oral stimulus to one which um, there's surprises or knock knock jokes as we move into say early infancy. Uh, and early childhood, flatus, belches, and as we get older, it gets more sophisticated, I guess, with slapstick, clowning, parody, and as we get older, still um, situational satire uh, types of laughter, and perhaps among the more sophisticated types of laughter responses of agenda-based satire and pathos or humor with pity and sorrow mixed in. Um, It turns out that as we get older, our laughter becomes less vocal and audible, especially in grade school and middle age, uh, seventh through 10th grade kids. Most of the laughter is non-vocal. It's more of a silent exhalation based type, um, which is an almost entirely absent in autism. So if you've ever talked to your kid and they're in their mode of great sarcasm and parental doubt. They'll often sort of, <laughs> sort of under their breath, laugh at you. And I, I think, as who, who among you as parents has seen this? <laughs> I know I <laughs> or did it? Yes, exactly. I did. So that pattern is presumably age appropriate. Uh, but there's a clue there that in autistic kids, for instance, they don't do that at all. Um, people overestimate their ability to rationalize why they're laughing. 90%, 95% of laughter turns out to be non-comedic. So in the elevator when someone says, oh, the weather's terrible and you laugh, eh, it's not really funny, right? But you laugh out of, I don't know, politeness or to shut whoever's up in the elevator. Or um, You know it's not funny though. And a lot of our laughter tends to be in, involuntary and not particularly associated with things that are funny. Has anyone ever seen this game where <laughs> the old guy is turning a handle there with a, another little uh, tray with cream on it, and at some point, you don't know when the cream gets launched into his face. It's, it's quite a funny game. If you've ever played it, it's, it's extremely, it's a hoot. Anyway, um, speakers laugh 46% more than their audience. Only 10 to 15% of their talk was thought to be objectively funny. Someone spent time researching this. Wait, what if I'm laughing at stuff that's not funny? Why? Well, it turns out it betrays social interest. So it's about 30 times more likely when you're in groups than when you're alone. Um, you need an audience, typically, unless you're really odd. It, it turns out that it conforms or confirms social inclusion and or exclusion. And there's often an agenda. It may not be an honest laugh. Um, here's the agenda here. The eagle thinks he's tickling the fox, but you, really it's not the case. <laughs> uh, where are zones in laughter and anatomically located? Um, I'm going to go through a little bit of the literature on this very briefly because it's, it's, it's easier to read yourself than for me to explain it. And then we're going to look at some of our epilepsy patients and uh, try and understand what we've found over the years just through observing mapping and other studies. So the literature, uh, there's a good paper here by Guillory and Bujarski that goes through various locations that were stimulated with emotional responses and for the functional Folks here, this is, you know, let me know if you want the reference on this, because this is quite neat. But basically, the red underlined stuff is the stuff that illustrated laughter. So you'll see the cingulate, the SMA, uh, the anterior corpus callosum. Um, the types of things elicited include uh, laughter with or without mirth, 
um, laughter dependent on current stimulus, uh, gelastic seizures, um, and other locations include inferior temporal lobe, mesial temporal lobe, um, subthalamic nucleus, et cetera. So if you're interested in looking through this more to see emotional states and emotional valence based on stimulation locations, let me know. Patient one, uh, this was a, at the time, I think she was probably about 43-year-old lawyer with hard-to-treat epilepsy. She had nocturnal hypermotor seizures that clustered with little to no scalp signatures on those events. Um, we had spent a while trying to figure out where her events were coming from, and then this really bizarre circumstance occurred where she had a carbon monoxide poisoning in her house, and um, everyone in the house was feeling a little off. The husband realized this was not good and took uh, the whole family to the emergency room. They were found to have monoxide elevations and they were all put in the chamber at Virginia Mason. Virginia Mason has a barrow chamber and that typically they'll do a dive um, for a couple hours to help um, get that monoxide off the uh, hemoglobin. The dive in that hyperbaric partial pressure of oxygen is really accelerated and that makes seizure activity way more likely. And in the hyperbaric chamber, she had a seizure, which is kind of a nightmare place to have it because it's hard to get people out. In any case, her seizure left her with a very distinct postictal Todd's paralysis on the left leg, um, which she had complained of sort of a sensory paralysis, a sensory issue postictally. Um, but this was a clear clue that what we thought was right hemispheric was most likely right hemispheric and close to midline and somewhere at motor cortex or anterior to it. So we put in some hardware. Uh, this is a 64 contact grid. You can see uh, various strip electrodes tucked in under the dura. The uh, map of that um, appears here with a ground and inverted four contact electrode, six contracts over the right frontal polar, some under the right temporal, a left hippocampal depth, and then these really neat um, bilateral interhemispheric electrodes. So these ones between the hemispheres here have uh, both sides facing electrode. And what we found uh, was on our SSEPs, we found a, a sort of typical anticipated location for sensory representation over the sensory hand region. We, sent, we found sensory representation for foot over the expected motor, uh, the sensory locations for foot. And then during stimulus, we were able to elicit laughter as well as problems expressing self and thinking of song words through the cingulate. And found later that her seizures were coming really from the most anterior contacts of her intrahemispheric strip. So the decision was made to try and chop out or surgically remove <laughs> Uh, a portion of her right frontal lobe, which was done, and this circle basically corresponds to where we were eliciting laughter from. And I was nervous when I went in to see her the next day, because she's a very bright, articulate lawyer, whose husband's a lawyer too. <laughs> I was nervous that we might have eroded her ability to laugh, and that would make her a very... Um, demanding, uh, precise lawyer in ways that I didn't want focused on me or our team. So I went in and I heard her out of the room laughing and I was like, yes, this is great. And she was laughing at uh, Monty Python videos and uh, it was very satisfactory. So if you take that chunk out, you can still find Monty Python funny. So uh, back to those ideas of myelination pathways with an infant versus an adult, the cingulate pathways are much more myelinated in adults. And this is basically where uh, she was having her laughter from. So a sophisticated type of laughter related to um, situational experiences and their corruption with unanticipated stimulation. She was, she was just displaying a sophisticated type of laughter from that location. Our second patient. This patient is extraordinarily hard to treat. He has drop seizures, uh, focal seizures, um, 
all kinds of events. He's been operated on multiple times before Ryder and I ever inherited him. He's had multiple resective surgeries, and over um, about three to four years ago, he started having these drop seizures where he consistently was having facial fractures and subdurals. And um, we went back and forth as to what to offer him because the seizures, he would go straight down. We settled on a corpus callosotomy. The um, corpus callosotomy is a procedure where the anterior two-thirds of the corpus callosum are cut. Um, and that helps in drop seizures where people are likely to injure themselves. It makes convulsive events less likely. The corpus callosotomy did what we hoped it would do. <clears throat> it stopped his convulsive, his drop seizures. He's not had any since that operation. The problem, though, is that he's had, since that time, just an incredible amount of abulia. He's had this alien limb phenomenon. He has a difficult time engaging. He has difficult times sustaining attention. And his laughter, which used to be similar to the lawyers based on situations and intrigue and satire, is now the elevator type humor. You, he laughs at things that he thinks others find funny, but he's not laughing at something that is a sustained buildup towards um, a more appropriate adult laugh. In that circumstance, he, he comes off as someone who's unable to mimic effectively. And he looks more like what you might see in a more classic case of autism. Um, we'll come back to that later, because I think it's very interesting how, yeah. I'm just curious, prior, I mean, it's hard to say, but prior to the multiple injuries and resections and whatever, what's the development of the brain disease? Yes, this guy graduated college. Um, so he, the calcitomy eroded his ability to mimic or mirror, and that's probably one of the important parts about laughter to bear in mind that there are these mirror neurons or mirror behaviors is perhaps a better term, where we mimic what we see others doing. So laughter's one, laughter's contagious. You may laugh because someone else is laughing. Other circumstances like that include crying, itching, if you've ever seen someone in clinic who's scratching, it's pretty hard not to want to scratch as well, especially if you have any concerns about scabies and mites and things. Uh, <laughs> and yawning is the other one where you can have a contagious yawn or, or these pathways that make you do what someone else is already doing. Patient three, this is a uh, patient I was following for seizures post-stroke um, and Here's his stroke. You can see it basically is MCA territory, wipes out temporal and frontal, wipes out basically expressive language locations. So this guy was left with an inability to use words effectively. He had some reasonable receptive language. He had lots of stuttering, mama, bubba, papa sort of sounds. But his wife and family were able to comprehend him um, extraordinarily well, and much of that was punctuated by these just unbelievable fits of laughing that he would have that were appropriate and broke up the idea he was trying to communicate in a manner that struck me as really odd. I don't think I've ever seen a communication style so filled with laughter and yet absent of language. Um, and that, uh, that becomes particularly interesting for me as a dad, because my son is nonverbal, and he laughs all the time. He's 16, and he communicates rather effectively, but he has receptive language, but no expressive language. So this sort of scenario where this large territory is damaged irreversibly becomes interesting as, well, you don't necessarily need the broker pathways to use um, humor and laughter. And that comes back to presumably there's more midline aspects to laughter. Um, laughter tends to be preserved when you have bilateral damage to speech motor regions. What's the problem with this scan? Anybody? <laughs> Anita. Actually, it does. What's that? Yeah, exactly. No, you're right. You have to figure that at some point in a lecture about laughter, there's going to be a midline bump associated with gelastic seizures. So, gelastic seizures is the term for laughing seizures. 
and on the boards, as soon as you see gelastic seizures, if the option is to circle or fill in the bubble for hypothalamic hamartoma, you should do it. It's gonna be the answer. It always appears on boards, neurology boards. I don't know about neurosurgery boards, but uh, the, this is a gimme. Um, the hypothalamic hamartomas are an infantile stimulus independent laughing associated with irritability and depressed mood. And it progresses over time if undertreated to complex partial seizures, possibly spasms and convulsive seizures. It's often associated with a precocious puberty because that tissue helps invigorate hypothalamic controls to pituitary tissue. Uh, this gentleman had nocturnal laughing age five, um, later diagnosis of epilepsy. Uh, so the laughter didn't clue parents into anything abnormal. And that's quite common that we'll hear stories that mom and dad heard the child laughing at night while asleep and they had no idea why. They thought it was a dream, but then the child was missing milestones and then the child had seizures. And then in retrospect, the laughter becomes more dangerous as more of a clue that something was going wrong. These are hard to treat, but since uh, laser ablative surgery came out, this has been increasingly the way that folks go in and fry these things. And this guy underwent some laser ablative surgery and did well. So the inverse to gelastic seizure is something called dacristic seizure. You may not see this on boards, but dacristic means crying. So some seizure types can trigger crying. Um, but by far the majority of seizures we see where crying is elicited are going to be non-epileptic or pseudo. Um, otherwise, if they are true epilepsy, it's going to be frontal lobe or temporal or hypothalamic. And most likely, it's going to be post-seizure, not during seizure. Um, patient five. This guy had laughing events that were non-mirthful. He looked somewhat pained. It often involved coughing. He also had the second type of event with stuttering speech and body jerking. His right face may pull up. He may get aphasic and confused during some of the events, and some of it may turn into later convulsive seizures. He'd had a prior resection, which is what circled there. Um, we didn't do the prior resection, this one. We uh, put an intracranial array over his left side looking for locations for seizure activity. And um, the seizures were gelastic or laughter-based seizures that were coming out of his left inferior temporal lobe. So not all gelastic seizures are hypothalamic in origin. And we took more of his temporal lobe. And he's done well. He's had no further gelastic seizures. He did return with presentation of psychogenic seizures, but with some <laughs> Anita's. That, he's doing well, Anita. We, we got him on the clear and narrow path. He's got those under control, so he's actually doing really well. Um, patient six, what's wrong with this scan? Anybody see anything strange on this one? See if I can get my, is the arrow coming up? No. Um, it's been read as abnormal in the border of the right now. Um, in any case, this patient has autism. And um, he laughs in response to slapstick and violence, uh, particularly slapstick violence like things like Chainsaw Massacre movies, he finds quite amusing. Um, but does not laugh in situations or, or perhaps more socially indicated times. He has um, slow wave sleep, spike and wave discharges, and left temporal seizures. Um, autism gets really interesting when you think about laughter because their ability to respond to emotional clues and emotional stimulus and interactive appropriateness, their ability to mimic, their ability to display these mirror neuron behaviors is really poor. And there's uh, the cousin to Sasha Baron Cohen, Simon Cohen, Simon Baron Cohen has written quite a lot about this and his literature is really good on it in terms of theories of autism. Central coherence or too much stimulus, empathy failures, mind blindness. I mean, some of this is more put into a psychologic type of 
uh, literature naming, but um, the way I view it is more as this failure, this really pervasive failure to use those mirror examples of how we should pattern behaviors and see that and incorporate that. It basically, to me, illustrates a failure to understand the grammar of interaction. I think autism is extremely interesting when you parallel it with what's supposed to happen in laughter and language development and what fails to happen. So patient seven. This patient, uh, Ryder and I have been working on for years. She has a multitude of seizures, left hand tingling, rapid progression to extension of the left arm, flexion of the right arm, stiffening the upper body, grimacing, face pulling. Um, she has a number of what are cortical dysplasias over the right and left side. These are inverted images. Sometimes the inversions show the dysplasias a little bit better. We uh, did a stereo EEG on her, gosh, what was this, like two years ago, I think? And um, the array of locations was predominantly over the right side. Uh, it, you can tell by the sheer um, <laughs> sp spread of the EEG electrodes that this was a little bit of what we would term a fishing expedition. Normally when we know really well where we're going, there's going to be a cluster of electrodes or a grid right over the top. When they're spread out over multiple lobes, it's more, uh, okay, let's see what we can get. Um, in any case, she displayed the majority of her seizures off the uh, red dot or the yellow dot with later spread to the green regions. So different locations involved in her network of seizure. And when you map, the stereo EEG mapping is a little bit different to the grid mapping because the depth electrodes go deep. And when they go deep, you're presumably touching onto white matter pathways. So when you stimulate, you may be not accurately representing the cortex. You may be more describing a network that is much more dis disparate. In any case, uh, still, despite that, her um, hand sense and motor locations were basically where we were anticipating um, speech motor and hand motor, hand sense and motor, um, and then elicited laughter in this right parietal electrode, as well as polka dots a little bit further behind it. So. Polka dots, funny, not really. It just this was a location where stimulation consistently elicited a uh, a tickle-like sense of laughter, an irritating but funny to her sense of laughter. So that makes sense, right? It's close to parietal. It's it's a weird sensation that causes a slight discomfort, manifest as laughter, but it's not mirthful. It's not sophisticated. It's very basic. Um, just some fancier images of where those uh, laughter locations were. Patient eight, HSV encephalitis up top, July 2015, that's his close to presentation HSV imaging. And by September, this is what his right temporal lobe looked like. So the herpes basically fried his entire temporal lobe, as well as portions of the inferior frontal lobe. And yet, his sense of humor and his ability to laugh was entirely preserved. So OK, we've wiped out the left MCA territory, and you can still laugh. We've wiped out the right temporal lobe. You still find things funny. Uh, there are lots of chunks of associative cortex you can ruin, but preserve your sense of humor. And presumably, that, that is a good thing to help us cope with what is awful. I mean, just look at what he lost here. Uh, patient nine, make it stop. So one of my hard to treat epilepsy patients with a vagus nerve stimulator was in clinic and uh, started having an, an uncontrollable grade school style laughing fit. Those are a joy to have, and as we get older, we sort of lose that, unfortunately. I, you know, it's very uncommon. I, where adults find themselves in states where they just can't stop laughing. But this adult in clinic was in that state with her vagus nerve stimulator. And I decided to be a jerk and see if I could use the magnet for a vagus nerve stimulator to stop this uncontrollable fit of laughter. The vagus nerve stimulator, we think, 
channels, nerve pathways that relay to the thalamus, which then helps relay bicortically uh, inhibitory signals for seizure activity. And I was hoping that we'd see something interesting with the magnet. The magnet was fairly, this is a strong magnet setting. It's a good solid magnet boost. boost. So I did it, nothing happened. So maybe thalamic pathways are not that related to laughter. Uh, vagus slash thalamic. I mean, the vagus goes down to the gut. There's nothing funny about the gut, except for farts. Uh, and the heart, too. There's, you know, there's not a lot that's really humorous or funny. Now. It's just not a pathway of, of humor. So if you look back at some of those stimulation studies, the stimulation locations in the thalamus, by and large, tend to be fairly mirthless and not terribly interesting. Um, so where, where can we put laughter? Well, midline structures, hypothalamic structures in sort of a primitive pathway, parietal sensory paths for a tickling-like sensation, um, mirth, pattern recognition, anterior mesial frontal cingulate, so more sophisticated types of laughter up in the midline, more on the right probably than left. Um, temporal, both lobes, perhaps more so on the left. The left tends to have more of an emotional valence for humor associated with it, while the right tends to have more of an emotional valence of anger associated with it. It's not lost with dominant receptive or expressive language regions, and it's not necessarily housed in right anterior temporal either. Um, and you can obliterate associative laughter by cutting fibers that communicate right anterior to left anterior. Um, so if you're going to look at it in more a diagnostic way, how can you use laughter as a clue based on age of presentation? The earlier the onset, the more likely it's going to be midline. Is if you see a gelastic seizure, it's midline until proven otherwise in an infant. Later onset could be anywhere, though, if you're going to follow the numbers, given temporal lobe epilepsy is more common than frontal, you'd be well versed in saying that temporal was most likely probably next by frontal, especially if there were nighttime predominant hypermotor events, you'd think frontal. And it may be um, important to add in what's going on otherwise. So for the inability to mimic, the inability to read emotional clues, that type of seizure, presumably it's gonna be deeper in midline in an autism patient than a lateralized um, neocortical um, adult onset patient. So there are other aspects to neurologic presentations where laughter or laugh, laughter presence or absence may betray pathology. So pseudobulbar palsies are one where there's laughter without mirth or crying without sadness, often spontaneous and degenerative dysfunctions. Narcolepsy, cataplexy, so in those disorders, a mirthful, fu sudden, funny stimulus can trigger a cataplectic or narcoleptic attack. Uh, frontotemporal dementia, the, the near complete loss of what they used to find funny with a much flatter and more blunt and more um, isolating kind of personality type as that dementia progresses. Alzheimer dementia, the tendency to laugh at things that just completely are not funny. Um, Alzheimer patients tend to be very amiable, at least early stage. Um, their humor types tend to be not terribly sophisticated. Um, and as the disorder progresses, the associative abilities to see humor in satire and pathos and things like that are almost completely gone fairly early in the disorder. Um, so if you hear about their sense of humor is gone, that's a red flag for Alzheimer's given how common it is. One in three of us will have it by age 85 if you want something to really stew over. Parkinson dementia, post-traumatic issues, depression, those all sort of explain themselves. Angelman syndrome, um, that disorder is an unfortunate moniker of the happy puppet syndrome where they have ataxias as well as uh, a very pleasant, happy affect and laughter. One of our family friends has, uh, they have a child with Angelman's and she liked the autistic patient I presented earlier found the most enjoyable humor types to be slapstick and violent horror movies. 
Go figure. It doesn't make sense to me, but there's something about those ridiculous horror movies that probably is underpinned with some neurologic aspects of tickling a funny bone in us in ways we don't really understand. Uh, drugs, obviously, psychiatric developmental failures. So the class clown, the bully who doesn't understand the joke, the potty humor that goes into a later stage of development that becomes inappropriate as we age, those can all be flags for attention, social isolation, psychiatric issues as well. So they're not ones to just blow off and think, oh, class clown, you know, he's the funny kid. Well, is he the funny kid because he has dyslexia or is he the funny kid because they can't attend or focus? Um, those are red flags as far as I'm concerned. Um, and social agenda. So on conclusion, this guy, he's laughing, but he's also giving the Dutch bird here. He's, he's, he's blowing someone off here, but uh, I think it's a funny painting. It, it to me, is, displays some wit and satire that's, uh, that's worth commenting on. Anyway, that's all I got. What you got, XL? Sorry, I just have a quick question. I, I uh, read a bunch of all of the stacks, like stuff, like way, way back in time. Do you ever hear uh, like a little lab speaking to this guy between music and the same launcher situation? Like you know, appreciation of applied music and certain types of music before launcher uh, surgery or procedures or anything like that. Um, is it the same kind of you mean that their musical appreciation gets more or less sophisticated? Yeah, I, I've not asked people about that. I, I think the book you're referring to is Musicophilia, um, which came out like five years ago, I think, um, which I read. But I, I've not seen. Um, the musical abilities improve or worsen. A lot of that musical literature is a little bit weird, too. I mean, it's very Eurocentric, and it's always about classical music. For some reason, it's almost never about music that the majority of people listen. Not judging here. But there, there's very little on that. There are types of epilepsy we consistently see where there is a musicogenic stimulus to the seizure. So for instance, we follow a patient who's Johnny Cash Johnny Cash's song, Ring of Fire, consistently causes her to seize. Uh, I've come across a few patients who have musical auras. Uh, one of Fleetwood Mac, I can't remember which song, and the other one was the Smurfs theme tune prior to the seizures. So these, these repetitive um, timing-based stimulus, so music has timing in it and rhythms in it, and rhythms, you know, in a very gross level, epilepsy is a disorder of rhythms. Might they somehow exaggerate or build a network reinforcement of abnormal electrical activity that provokes? Anyway, it's speculative, but the the areas like Heschel's gyrus and these musical appreciation, sound appreciation regions are often involved in seizure, and we use that to help plaster electrodes over those locations. So I think. And Ryder, correct me if I'm wrong, we've gone looking for Heschel's gyrus onset seizures quite a lot. And I don't recall one case of actually nailing it down and seeing it. That wasn't her location anyway. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, Probably tried three or four times. Yeah. So yeah, music is, is, uh, is, is fascinating in, in my way of thinking as a trigger for seizures, but I've not seen it. I've not asked it in way of has your musical taste changed as a indication of issues that are ongoing or worsening. Um, and I'm just thinking of all my friends or, or in college, for instance, people who liked a certain type of music who I was not friends with and couldn't remotely understand why they, anyway, it probably betrays more about me than them. <laughs> are there other questions? Yeah, right. It seems like you're describing essentially the limbic network that most of the pathways in the tape circuit are involved in laughter. And we, we know that it's also kind of our emotional regulation network. Are you aware of any areas outside of the limbic network that are highly associated with laughter? Um, no. Yeah. 
No, I mean, if you, if you look at, say, pure motor or occipital, those seem to be completely devoid of any humor f content, but uh, associative that channel into memory paths ultimately, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, it's a little bit, uh, would you include the hypothalamus as part of the limbic pathway? Well, uh, the mammillary bodies are, and I think that's close well, enough. I mean, those early studies in cats stimulating the hypothalamus, I think they could get, you know, rage and joy and sort of basic, you know, bodily functions, including laughter, I think. But uh, I don't know that that was important at all. Yeah. I, you know, the other way to think of the limbic is, is it the essential grammar building structure for us interpreting information in a way that it's useful? It's got timing. It's got punctuation, it's got memory, it's got evocation, it's got accentuation. It, it just seems like that analogy of thinking of these paths of language and laughter as related to a kind of grammar are really fascinating to think about. Other questions? Dean, yeah. For patients who have lost the ability to laugh, are there any studies in terms of how that impacts their quality of life? I'm not aware of any. I'm not sure how you'd necessarily study that. Uh, I don't know. The, 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 the perhaps best entry level to this stuff is the paper by Provine called Sidewalk, Adventures in Sidewalk Neuroscience on Laughter, something like that. Provine is the name. It's a really neat paper. It's just short and sweet and fun to read. It's definitely one that you could get through start to finish and not be bored. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Good. Well, thank, thank you, you guys.